how noisy and how loud should we be in today's environment? How loud and noisy could we be or should we be to get our messages across? And I think bring together all our ideas and questions about today's media landscape. And also how do we recognize good content, quality content, and where do our values come into play? So now I'm, I'm very, very happy to start off with today's session um, because um, this is also a very special session uh, for me. Um, the two guests we have today, the two presenters are very, very dear to me. And I will start with Rob Weinberg. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rob is a very, very experienced journalist. He has uh, experience of almost 30 years on national radio, especially the BBC radio. He's an art historian, author, radio producer. He has just published a, a new publication. So a very, very warm welcome to you, Rob. Thank you so yeah. much for joining. Thank you. Nice to be here. And then I'm, I'm also very excited to, um, to present to you as the second presenter today, Omid Scobie. Omid is a, a long-term journalist as well. Um, he has been working for um, the magazine US Weekly after, um, and the, afterwards he joined Harper's Bazaar. He's a royal correspondent, um, very, very uh, busy these days, as you, you might imagine. And he also produces and is the host of a very successful post podcast called The Earpod, which I, uh, ever since I came across, I really enjoy listening to. Um, Omid is very outspoken about uh, issues that ha we have been discussed earlier as well about how the media landscape is changing and how at the same time as, us as journalists, as media producers have to change as well and yeah, live up to our standards, our own values. A very warm welcome to you, Omid. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you. I feel like I'm not worthy of that, with that welcome, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Good to meet you all. <laughs> um, we will have two parts tonight to get to know Omid's and Rob's work a little bit more and also their experience, how they actually put into practice values and, and the ideas that we all try to put into practice. And the session, second uh, part of the session will be a more practical one where we will, we will we'll be discussing uh, the ideas of a podcast, how to set it up, what's holding all of us back. That was something that, that Omid actually asked when we discussed this session earlier. What's, what's holding everybody um, back from producing their own podcast? So I'm sure that at the end of the session, everybody will walk away with a wonderful idea of their own podcast and how to become a very great pod, um, producer. So maybe we start off with, with some, some questions that are really on my mind and I would like to, to discuss with you, Rob and Omid, um, your formation as a journalist, your idea to enter into journalism. What made you enter into this realm? What were the triggers for you, the motivation? And maybe you can also take us with you um, how, what was the landscape then when you entered it and how did it change? Maybe Omid, you, you jump right into it and you start. Sure, well, I mean, I think with every journalist, the, the beginnings of your career start out very different to sort of where you end up sort of 10, 15 years down the line. And for me, I, I've always had a sort of innate curiosity about the world and uh, I also had a huge interest in technology and entertainment news. And so I wanted to sort of work in that field. And so as a teenager, that's really what I focused on, building websites, that kind of stuff, doing create, generating my own content before I actually had a shot in the industry itself. I studied journalism at University of Arts in London, but I would say, although I entered the industry in the entertainment news space, it was probably maybe the biggest culture shock for me in terms of coming into the industry as a Baha'i, because I think almost immediately from the get-go, you're presented with a plethora of sort of uh, ethical and moral dilemmas from, from the get-go. And I'd say, if anything, it's those moments that have really shaped my direction in my career, or at least who I am as a journalist. Uh, I think there are many people that warned me along the way that, you know, this isn't going to work if you're not going to play the game. And of course, as, as many of you know, 
the sort of entertainment news space is filled with fiction and backstabbing and gossip and all the rest of it. And for me, I wanted to find a place within that where I didn't have to uh, gain values and morals, but at the same time could find success within that. And I found, to be honest, being always what got me through uh, as much as it pained many of the editors that I worked on that sort of constantly fought with me about uh, sort of over headlines or sort of exaggerated headlines or so on for me I really wanted to be able to stories that had depth that had uh, truth in them at the same time but were also just as compelling as perhaps some of the the stuff that was already out there that perhaps didn't tick some of those boxes. And so I very quickly found myself working in the entertainment news space in the US. Um, pretty much my entire career has been with US media organizations. And I found that perhaps my values were sort of more reflected in the workplaces there. And I also, you mentioned uh, Us Weekly, it's a magazine I worked at for 10 years. I ran the, the European Bureau over here in London, um, but that was really the first opportunity I had to kind of put my own stamp on things. I worked with an incredible editor whose background was a social worker. And so he oh, came wow. in from a very different place to perhaps the sort of other journalists I've experienced having above me in the industry. And so we really drove like very different policies within the entertainment news space uh, quite early on. We sort of changed the approach to covering mental health stories. Um, working alongside professionals and really kind of trying to set the standard within the industry in the US. We were the first publication to uh, ban the use of uh, unauthorized photos of families and children. Of course, in the US, the sort of freedom of information and freedom of speech enables you to really run anything that you want. And so it's always down to the, the media organization to make those decisions and they often don't. So I found myself very lucky that I was able to kind of bring my own values to the job, but at the same time, start to create my own profile for it. And obviously, when I moved into Royal News um, full time about three and a half years ago, that was something that I kind of brought with me into the into the role, but as kind of loudly and unapologetically as I could, because I figured, you know, at this point, I've put enough time into the industry to kind of be who I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I found it's really helped me actually build a profile um, that perhaps I almost in a way look back and wish I had done that sooner. You know, sometimes you're afraid of kind of challenging the norms, but actually I found by doing so, uh, I've been able to kind of grow my career even quicker. It's also won me a lot of enemies along the way. I would say I'm not very popular <laughs> with the British tabloids over here, um, simply because I have been the one that's kind of challenged um, perhaps some of the race issues that have kind of played a role in the royal, royal story in the past few years, but also sort of the kind of ongoing issues, and we may talk about this later within our industry of sort of lack of representation in newsrooms, be it socioeconomic, racially, from a gender perspective. These are things that I really try and talk regular basis even if it does make some people uncomfortable along the way yeah that's wonderful that's something that i found very impressive when we talked uh last week uh preparing for the session that you really for me it was very clear that in journalism and as you live it there's really this part of how you act as a person in a mm. certain organization that's one part and then also how do you fulfill your role as a journalist and there's another <laughs> set of, of yeah tasks for you there and challenges for you there and uh, yeah we, we will talk about the uh, this idea of representation what it also means and the changing landscape a little bit more I think that's very very exciting and interesting um, and and Rob maybe you can you can take us on a little journey on on your yeah, on you becoming a journalist, especially in a big organization like the BBC, you have both experiences working inside and outside of the organization, more or less, or the institution of the BBC. And maybe you can let us know what made you enter into journalism in the first place. Thank you. I, I want to pay tribute to Omid because uh, 
he's very courageous. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, as some of you will know that he's written the book Finding Freedom about Harry and Meghan. And uh, he's been absolutely pilloried in the press. <laughs> and uh, but he's been very courageous and he's stuck to his guns on, on his principles. So it goes to show how, um, how uh, difficult it is, how difficult a world it is to operate in, actually. Um, I, I it was started out, I mean, I think one of my challenges in life has always been that I'm interested in everything. You know, I always enjoyed finding out about everything. And um, I studied uh, visual, visual art and art history and music. I got involved with radio as a student. There was a BBC local radio station in Brighton across the road from where I was studying. And they ran a, a youth program on a Sunday night, which was all presented and put together by youth volunteers. So I got involved with that. And um, I was doing book reviews and film reviews and interviews with uh, visiting musicians and um, various things like that. And then when I finished my degree, I thought, I don't really want to be a starving artist. Uh, how can I keep my interests open? And I was lucky in that I had this experience of radio. And my voice, I mean, when I went for my first interview with a uh, radio station, uh, they gave me a news bulletin to read and said, read that. And I just read it. And they said, right, you've got the job. And I thought if I'd known that, <laughs> <laughs> if I'd known I was going to get a job based on my voice, I probably wouldn't have gone through four years of uh, studying, you know. But, uh, but you just have to, everybody has just to close their eyes and listen to Rob because your voice is just, yeah, very soothing indeed. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I got, into, I got into a newsroom initially in the BBC local radio. And um, I think one of the things that shot me straight out was the emphasis on conflict that has to be there in, in terms of the, the values that underpin a lot of journalism. Um, and this was... This is going back to 1988, but I can always remember my first day actually going into the newsroom and the news editor saying, great, we've got a murder <laughs> and <laughs> sending me off to some, sending me off to this little house where an old man had been found. I was, um, and just this idea that, you know, if it involves conflict, if it involves violence, if it involves argument, then, um, then it's news. And if it doesn't, it's not. And one day I was, um, spent all day actually putting together a piece. There was a very big new facility opening for old people and um, they'd spent millions of pounds and I'd been down there, I'd done lots of interviews and then about eight o'clock at night I was putting this piece together and then the editor came down and she said, well, we can't run that. And I said, why? And she said, well, there's no conflict in it. And I said, well, what do you mean by conflict? She says, well, you, you need to find a neighbour who doesn't like the idea of having these old people's facility you know backing onto their house or whatever it may be and I think the extreme the most extreme version of that was when I went to cover the opening of the terraces for the BBC World Service um, I suggested uh, doing this piece and actually they commissioned a 15 minute piece um, about the opening of the terraces in 2001 and the editor at the BBC said to me um, make sure you find some dissenting voices and I was like, I'm not sure they're going to be that many. <laughs> like 3,000 3, Baha'is coming from all over the world. I'm not sure anyone's going to disapprove of it. Um, and he said, no, no, you've got to. Uh, and he gave me the telephone number of the PLO representative in London, you know, Palestine oh, Liberation. <laughs> and he said, call him. So I called this guy and I said, hello, I'm from the BBC. I'm doing a piece about the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa. Just wondered if you had a view on it. And he said, oh, I love those gardens. I go there all the time with my family. <laughs> so, then I, so then I went back to the BBC. I said, well, the, you know, the PLO guy loves it. He says, no, it's not good enough. You have to find some, someone. And I, I went out of my way in Haifa to visit the Arab cultural centres and talk to people. And everyone was very positive about it, you know. But it just shows that, again, he, 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 his, his, his take was, well, I, I'm not going to put out a 15 minute advertisement about the Baha'i faith on, on the radio. I, I need to hear people who aren't happy about it, you know, and um, it, it was a sort of some uh, discomfort for me, you know, in that respect. So I think a lot of the news values um, that underpinned, you know, the, that sort of idea, it, I mean, the extreme case, I'll just share another one, which was terrible. 
but um, sometimes there were days where there was nothing. You know, you know, there was no news. In the early days of the BBC, sometimes they just cancelled the news. They just say, there's no news tonight. <laughs> We're just going to move on to the next programme. But now you have to fill time, you know, and you have to fill these airtime. And I remember looking in a local council uh, agenda for the meeting that they were going to be discussing. I think it was in Cambridgeshire or Bedfordshire. And uh, they said they were going to be discussing introducing halal meat onto this menu for school children, school dinner menu, you see. And of course, you know, oh, there's a, there's a story. <laughs> so what do you do in those circumstances? You go to the most extreme local politician you can find who says, this is terrible. This is the thin end of the wedge. You know, we're going to, uh, you know, what's what next sort of thing. And then your headline becomes, you know, a furious row has broken out over the introduction of halal meat onto the school dinner menu, you know. And it's it's manipulative, you know, it's, it was actually that whole furious row was just created, you know, because of this sort of desire to create conflict and to, to, to find an argument to report, otherwise it's not news. So I think, that, you know, those were some sort of the early experiences. I mean, there was a lot of other good experiences as well, but I was just highlighting those because I remember talking to Dr. Arbab once when I was in Haifa and he said, how long have you been in, in journalism? And I said, oh, at that point, it was about 20 years. And he said, and what have you done to change it? And I was like, quite embarrassed, you know, <laughs> that, that, you know, sometimes the sort of value systems are so ingrained in, in, in these places that it's very difficult to make any kind of tangible uh, change. But I think what's changed in the last few years is this great democratization of the media and creativity. And the internet has enabled, you know, in the past, a writer wanted to write a book you know, you have to get an agent, you have to get a publisher, you know, you get rejection and all the rest of it. Now people can write their books, they can self-publish. Now people yeah. can make their music, they can self-publish. People can make podcasts, they can make shows, radio programs about whatever they want and self-publish. And, you know, it's removed that kind of control. Um, and, it, and, it, and it has created an opportunity now, I think, for people to bring their own values to bear. Um, so uh, in recent years, um, I've been, I actually went back to university and I did a master's in art history and um, I started writing um, for the Telegraph newspaper and Apollo magazine and British Art Journal and some of the other um, newspapers and magazines, magazines. But even then, um, recently I was asked, there was a new portrait of the Queen unveiled um, and they asked me to review it. And it's really a terrible painting. <laughs> I couldn't. And, and I was trying to be so Baha'i about it. I was trying to write this piece saying, you know, it's the meticulous attention to detail and this and that. And the um, editor, this was actually during a National Assembly meeting. I don't know, Wendy might remember this, but they kept calling me and saying, you don't really like it, do you? Say a bit more, say a bit more. <laughs> and I was like, so I kind of, um, you know, try to, but, Anyway, then it then it's um, appeared in the Telegraph, um, and this is the headline they put up: "The new portrait of the Queen is a bland and kitschy disappointment." <laughs> Miriam Escoffier's painting is one of the most tedious, weightless portraits of Her Majesty to appear for years. Those weren't my words at all, but even then, you know, even as fair as I was trying to be, um, the editor decided to put their own um, headline on to sort of get some attention but uh, yeah. I did yeah. actually find myself that day on the same page as Omid in the Telegraph because um, he was having this <laughs> all these challenges with um, Meghan and Harry's story and I was slagging off the portrait of the Queen so um, but anyway I mean I think <laughs> I, I, I think it I think it is challenging uh, but I think the the landscape has changed and it's and now it's really opened it up um, for, for better or for worse so that you know those kinds of interventions from editors and things like that aren't aren't necessarily going to hold you back from doing the kinds of things that you want to do. Yeah, yeah. I think the issue of presentation has been addressed a lot lately in the last couple of years, and I think also the it, there was a like a democratizing effect through social media and through what you described that it's it's that it's very empowering that. You have everything at, at your own hand, at your fingertip, just at owning a smartphone. I think that's, that's very, very powerful. 
Um, what I uh, observe, I have, I have had the same journalistic training in the past, and I remember at Rutland Gate, we were discussing it, like always trying to, to find the conflict, and that's very, very difficult as a Baha'i. Um, but I, th I see that there is a new challenge for us um, at the horizon, which is the search for truth. And um, that's something that Omid, I think you addressed uh, earlier um, when you just started, because you have individuals that can put out content and that can gain an audience that is sometimes, uh, yeah, a double or triple of what a, a newspaper might reach in people, right? A single person. And then you have an organization like an established news organization that has at least some forms of proof, truth and truth searching and some, some systems in place that ensure that, yeah, that there is at least the, the attempt to, to, to get, get the truth out of something. And um, I don't know, maybe you have some, some ideas about this, Omid, because I'm also reading your book at the moment. And I, I, I just, I, I love the idea that um, it's, it's very unemotional and it's very oriented. That's what I love. There's details, so much information, and it's really up to the reader to come up with their own idea of this whole, this story. And I think that sometimes you, you only get opinions these days and not so mm. many facts. Yeah, I think the sort of broad media landscape that we're in has sort of created this whole genre of journalism, which is simply comment based. You know, people, you, you look through a newspaper these days and it's really the, the, the colonists and, and, the, and the sort of public figures giving their opinion on the stories that are making the front pages more than anything else. And, and these, these opinions really go, in, go on to the sort of more than inform people, but also shape their opinions. And, you know, it's very interesting. I mean, the media has always played this sort of very important role in presenting information, being that sort of link to the public in terms of providing them with the facts, the who, what, where, when. And I think as we've seen this sort of appetite for more as the news cycle has changed, as the landscape has kind of revolved around this sort of digital news cycle. So it's 24 seven, 365 days a year, it's relentless. The quality control then becomes lesser in the process. And, you know, I think there's already a very sort of limited amount of regulation or within the industry in itself. But what we have now is of course, is whilst there are so many great things about opening it up to content creators and allowing opportunities for individuals to get their story out. I mean, medium, dot com is a brilliant mm. example of that i know so many people have actually sort of made their first steps into journalism through that site and there are some incredible storytellers and newsmakers using that platform for really good reasons but at the same time and i think most of us have certainly seen examples of this in the sort of covid era is that it's so easy to put anything out there now without any kind of editor's approval above that or any kind of uh, code of conduct to follow and for it to very quickly become gospel, you know, it then becomes repeated. I'm sure we've all received links from family members on WhatsApp groups to stories claiming something that is completely untrue. But because of the amount of times it's been told, uh, we start to sort of believe it as the truth. And there isn't, there are very few people that are fighting against that. Mm -hmm. This sort of misinformation crisis that we're dealing with at the moment is not only within the media industry itself, but also just generally within the online media space. Um, and so to go back to the point that you made about the book, I really wanted to try and stick to the who, what, where, when mm -hmm. as much as possible, because I think that we're already existing in an era where we're constantly being tried to sort of, or our opinions are, are constantly challenged by those giving commentary or opinion within the online space or within the media. We're always being influenced. And I think that there's a real need to a, for, for a space in which people can just be given the information and allowed to make up their own minds. And I think that's something that we'll see continue to change over time as some of platforms become 
a little bit more regulated. Mm. But um, it is something that, you know, as journalists, it's certainly a struggle when you're constantly, I, I've spent more of my time trying to, uh, I guess, get to the bottom of inaccurate and sort of stories filled with misinformation more than I do my day job these days because, you know, you're constantly dealing with clickbait headlines and all the rest of it. No, yeah. So maybe it's time for us now to, to talk about a particular phenomenon in, in today's landscape, which is really the, the, the work in our session today, which is the podcasts that have gained so much, um, yeah, so much value in the last couple of years. There's so many podcasts out there in German. There is already so many, but English speaking, I, I read a number which was something like there's like 25,000 podcasts, ho podca active podcast hosts um, on a, a platform like Spotify, which makes, I don't know how many thousands of, of episodes. Um, again, there's a, there's a question here of how do you gain an audience? How do you attract people to that podcast, which is something that we might discuss later. But maybe we can first talk a little bit more about the concept and Rob you might have some ideas about it because a podcast is really just a person's voice and sometimes there's a there's an interview partner but at, the only thing you get from this person is their voice and I think people are very very attracted to this phenomenon do you think it's something it's a reaction to an overload in the digital realm um, of videos, lots of pictures that we want to, to sort of regress again, or is there something else to connecting to a person over their voice? Well, I think, um, you know, every time something new comes along in the world, they say it's going to be the death of something else, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so when cinema came out, it was like, it, that's going to be the death of theater. When television came out, they said that's going to be the death of cinema and so on. And um, all of these things survived. You know, they all have their own um, different kinds of uh, purpose. And radio actually has been one of the, is, is among the oldest. Um, it sort of predates all of them, really. Um, <clears throat> and I think the thing about radio uh, and audio medium is it's, it's something you can do while, other while you're doing something else. And you see, television is always, uh, is, quite, is quite a passive, I mean, you can have a TV on, but there's not much value uh, in the pictures if you're doing something else, you know. Uh, and television, I find, is a very passive medium. I can watch things on television and completely forget about them. You know, I wake up the next morning and think, what did I watch last night? Whereas the thing about audio is that um, it kind of enters in, into your head at a different level. And because you might be doing other things like driving or you're on the commute or um, ironing or whatever you might be doing, um, Somehow, we always say the pictures are better in radio <laughs> because you create the images for yourself and you're, and you're using sound when you're producing radio or podcasts, you're producing, you're using sound to, to create images in the mind of the, the person who's listening. And I think what's changed now, of course, is that because of digital platforms, people can access what they want when they want it. And there used to be a thing in broadcasting called appointment listening, which is I'm going to sit down at eight o'clock every night and I'm going to listen to my favorite program or I'm going to put the news on at six or whatever it may be. But now you can access content at any time, whenever you want it. So, you, you know, podcasts can vary from the BBC, for example, produces all its regular programs for its networks, but all of them are now available on BBC Sounds and the BBC Sounds app has hundreds of thousands of programs going back decades. So you can actually go back and find stuff, you know, if there's a particular program you like, you can listen to episodes of it going back decades, literally. Um, and what that means is of course, that you can access what you want when you want it. And it also means that you can um, create content that appeals to particular groups. It can be very niche. You know, people, you can have a podcast about sort of a, anything really um and you will find your audience which is global mm. you know? so in certainly in the commercial world they're always constantly thinking about um numbers you know obviously it's, it's always about getting the figures 
especially if it's commercial, you know, the more people listening, the more you can charge for advertising and so on. Um, but, and, and to some degree, you know, the, the sort of bigger podcasts uh, platforms do that, you know, they're looking, they're looking to attract large numbers of people. But equally, someone who's an enthusiast about a particular subject or has something they want to say about something, then just do it. You can record it. You can get a little mic in your in your flat. Um, you can record it straight onto your laptop. You can edit it using free software from the internet, and you can post it. And you can begin to sort of build up a, 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 a niche audience. I mean, Omid would know more about this than I because he started his own podcast, yeah. and now it's yeah. now it's been sold sold to a major <laughs> network. But um, you know, the the podcasts uh, that I'm working for currently. Um, was begun five years ago by a, a historian called Dan Snow, who's quite a well-known figure from TV and does a lot of history documentaries. He just literally sat down with his phone or he walked around with his phone, went to visit various historical sites, battlefields, these sorts of things, started this podcast called History Hit, and it now has two million listeners a month. It's really very, very successful. So what History Hit's been able to do from that five years ago, just Dan and his phone, has to begin to create content which is um, applicable, you know, just to different interest groups. Yeah. And, um, and, they, and that can vary from, like you say, one voice. It could be just someone, a lot of the American podcasts are someone just writes a script and delivers it. And, and uh, you know, they build up a following. There's a sort of storytelling element. Uh, the BBC podcasts are more like the BBC radio programs. They often have panel discussions or comedy or, you know, different kinds of um, features and magazine style formats and so on. So it can be as simple or as sophisticated as, as you're able yeah. to do it. Yeah. So the first takeaway really is that you've also uh, said this before, is really finding your, your topic that you can be authentic about. And the second, <laughs> second takeaway is that topic has to really give you, give you something that you can feed off for a couple of episodes, you said that for one uh, history uh, podcast, you were supposed to come up with, what did you say, 20, 20 ideas? Oh, yeah. It was actually, um, I, I, I started two series last year, and before we even launched, we had 30 episodes of each ready, ready done. And, and the reason was that I've noticed with my own podcast called Ponder, which some of you might have come across, uh, I think Daniel just put the link in the, um, in the chat there. Um, we thought, wouldn't it be nice to do a podcast which is about culture, which is a kind of seeing the world through a Baha'i lens, but not being explicitly Baha'i, but saying we're here to sort of celebrate culture. We're interested in culture from other countries. We're interested in um, high art, low art, community art, whatever it may be. And we just started without really thinking about it. And um, it has been a struggle to keep it going. Um, because it seems that, you know, if you're going to build an audience, you want to build an audience, it's got to be regular. You've, and now, for example, History Hit is daily. There's, a, there's every single day at six in the morning, a new podcast goes up. Um, yeah. So they're recording five or six uh, in a day and then staggering it through the week. So yeah. if you, it depends what you want to do. But I think if you want to build an audience, it's got to be regular. You've got to kind of build a community around it. Um, and so people just like appointment listening in the past they'll think oh you know on my way to work i'll listen to the latest history hit episode or or whatever it may or the airport <laughs> i just wanted to to um ask omid first the about the idea of setting up your own podcast what made you do it because in addition to your regular columns your writing you i don't know what came podcast but I mean, you were an established writer already and a voice and an uh, mm. Instagram personality. What made you start a podcast in addition to all of that as well? I mean, I guess for me, I, so I started this podcast almost three years ago now. Um, it uh, focuses on the sort of lives and philanthropic endeavors of the British royal family, um, of course, following the news cycle as well and you know prior to covering or going full-time in royals my beat was entertainment news and I was spent pretty much 10 years focusing on someone else's brand which was the magazine I worked for and I think when I left I realized I hadn't perhaps focused much on my own brand and so 
alongside the other work that I was doing in the royal space, I also just wanted to find my own space where, as well as being able to go into more depth about the stories that perhaps sometimes I'm only talking about for, you know, two minutes on Good Morning America, I wanted a, a space where we could go into sort of a 45 minute deep dive on one particular subject or to have a conversation with someone who had worked with a member of the royal family on a specific project. But I also wanted people to perhaps get to know a little bit about me as just a journalist, uh, not kind of under anyone else's umbrella. So I started the podcast on my own. I asked another journalist to join me um, as sort of a, a stand-in co-host because sometimes I think it's much easier to get started when there's two of you to, to jive off each other. Um, but it was very bare bones. I mean, it was literally, I bought two very inexpensive mics off Amazon, plugged them into my MacBook, and I had never edited audio before. So it was very basic editing. We would just cut out a few bits here and there if we had to look something up on Google or we were interrupted by a phone call or whatever it was. And it was very simple, but because I already had a social media following, you're instantly able to kind of put that out there and those that are interested in the work that you do start listening. And, you know, you mentioned at the start of the show, I, my question was like, well, what's everyone waiting for to start a yeah. podcast? It's often something that I say to friends who talk, come, come to me with great podcast ideas and they're like, oh, but, you know, I don't have a studio or I don't know editing or I don't have the right mics. And this past year during the pandemic has been a reminder to me that you actually need very little to, to keep a podcast going. Um, so the podcast I started ended up moving over to a big US network, ABC News. And so they now produce it, they look after it. It's technically sort of their property as well as mine. And that brought in the world of us doing it in the studio and a very becoming a very different production. But obviously during the pandemic, those studios weren't available. It was really essential staff only coming into the workplace every day. So myself and my co-host and my current co-host, we started just recording it off our phones from home in the middle of lockdown. And I think the fact that we were able to just keep delivering it on a regular basis is what kept the audience engaged. They're not waiting for us to come back with the slick, polished sound of, the, of doing it from the studio, they just want the conversation that we give them every week and the insight that we give. So it's actually taken some of the pressure off me. It's reminded me that you actually don't need for it to be sort of all singing, all dancing. As long as you have, as Rob said, a space in which you can kind of own. You know, so if you are doing a history podcast, what era are you covering? And what even within that era are you covering? So for me as a royal correspondent, uh, yes, I am a general royal correspondent, but my focus is the younger royals. So uh, w William and Kate, Harry and Meghan, that's always been sort of my smaller focus. And on top of that, to make it even more niche, I focus on delivering that to US audience rather than a British audience, because there are enough British, correspondent, uh, British royal correspondents over here. So I've really created this tiny niche, but within it, there is an audience that want to engage and they want to listen. So don't ever worry about sort of picking something that seems so bizarre and niche because there will always be an, an audience there. I think going too broad is the worst thing you can do with the podcast or stressing about the quality of it. I think as long as you have, look, listen, I did the last episode of the podcast on my iPhone um, in, a, in a field in Windsor after the funeral of Prince Philip. And it was one of our highest sort of downloaded episodes in the first 24 hour period in, in quite some time. So it really doesn't matter. People just want to know that the episode is going to drop at a specific time and that they get what they subscribe to. I think well, another thing that's really worth thinking about is it seems that, like like Omi just said, it, people buy into relationships. You know, you, you it's it's community, really, isn't it? So it's kind of like the the listeners who listen to the AirPod are, like the relationship between Omi and his colleague. They're they're chatting like friends, and and it's like it's kind of like local radio, you know, where the same people kind of phone up every day and <laughs> take part in all the competitions and they feel like the list I was always taught that a good broadcaster is someone who makes you feel like you're the only person listening 
you know so yeah. there's a kind of intimacy and especially so many of the podcasts are about like football you know it's a lot of the british ones um about sport and you've got two or three mates who are just sat around chatting mm. as they always do about the football last night's game or what's coming up or what do you think and actually people love that kind of relationship that's what they're sort of buying into so yeah. so you know that that's another kind of format that can work very well um that people enjoy i, I listen to one there's two art art historians um the, the the art critic for the sunday times and a tv art presenter they do one uh, a podcast and it's just the two of them enthusing like if you if you could have any painting in the world on your wall what would it be <laughs> and how do you they just you know each week each episode they're talking about another painting you know like and why and why it's such a great painting and you know and and you, I enjoy just listening to that banter as we say between the two of them you know we we have a couple of questions already there's one that is concerning the right podcast hosting company maybe Omid you have a you have an idea for that what what did you start off with yeah I had that dilemma when I started, because there's actually so many of them. And I was like, how do I even get this to as many places as possible? I signed up for a company called Podbean, um, who I think is still around now, but it was so simple. We just upload the, the audio and it immediately went out to, from Google Podcasts to Stitch, to Apple Podcasts, to Spotify. They've put it out on everything almost immediately. And it was very, it was very easy actually. Um, and in fact, I remember even one episode, I had a, a very tech phobic friend upload the audio for me because I was on holiday at the time and I was I couldn't get my phone to work. And I said, here's the login for my Dropbox. Could you please just do it for me? And so that kind of stood the test of time until I passed the podcast. We, we, I used that for like 10 months or so. Um, and it's great because you also get really detailed analytics about how many uh, downloads are coming in for the episode, how long people are listening to it for. Um, it's always uh, in interesting to see, you know, when people often sort of stop listening to something. Um, so, yeah, I think some of these you have to pay extra for, but it's a very simple, easy to use platform. There's one really wonderful question from John, um, which is quite broad. And maybe, John, you want to, to ask the question yourself. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, this has been so, so wonderful to hear. This is a whole arena that I have no experience with, but I'm coming to listen because... Um, I'm on the board of directors of the um, Mona Foundation Canada, which, but we're focused on education as an access both out of poverty and also helping individuals fulfill their potential and by extension communities in the world and focus particularly on the education of women and girls and gender parity with all the various voices in the world with clamor for attention to everything. And um, how does one work with this world we are in at the moment to bring the, the, the items that are truly important, which is that we're all engaged in this wonderful development of the world. We all have a role and, and an organization like ours can help facilitate that role so that we can all become agents of development, as it were. What's the purpose of transferring information if it isn't to educate ourselves to do better to transform and all of that good stuff a group and this is my first foray into ebbf so how a group of wonderful people like you can help the important work but the work that's being done in the ngo space by organizations like like um the one i'm involved with and there are many many more i think what's what i found really and i'm sure rob will, will feel this way too what i found really satisfying about the podcasting space actually is how receptive your audience is to uh, things that perhaps don't fit the subject that they've actually subscribed for you know I, I think I've been able to have certainly as the podcast matured I've been able to have some really interesting conversations that have absolutely nothing about the royal family but may stem from one very brief moment in the news cycle and we're then able to engage in a bigger conversation 
about uh, racism in the UK or talking about gender equality in the workspace, for example, or even early years childhood development. You know, there are things and, and bringing in really insightful voices from, from organizations and think tanks and people who can actually provide even more information alongside our own thoughts and opinions. And it's been really satisfying to be able to have that and know that the listeners, after you kind of build a relationship with them, are, are also keen to hear what your thoughts are on other things. It's almost like following someone on uh, Twitter, for example you follow them because you're interested in them as a personality, not necessarily in the sub, just the subject that they're talking about. And so when they share something that sort of doesn't fit in the, um, the sort of area that perhaps they focus on, let's say it's a sports personality, when that sports personality then talks about something that's important to them, a charitable organization or an initiative, they're involved in you still listen you're still engaged because you you signed up to hear what they have to say and so I think with podcasting it's one of the very few spaces that allows you to be able to sort of veer off off track every now and then um, but still keep people engaged and you know I think it's very different to going to a news website where we're picking and choosing what we're getting it's like you when people press play on a podcast they're usually going to stay for the full 45 minutes or so and I found that one of the the most I guess why I continue to do it because it's certainly not the most lucrative area of the sort of media market at the moment it's very much gr a growing space still and I think that there are still companies still trying to work out how to monetize it properly um, but I think in terms of being able to have a voice, but also lend a voice to others and have a platform that others can use. It's certainly become a really interesting and vital tool. I don't, I don't really have much to add on, on this point, but I was just thinking about this idea of um, a space, creating a space where, you know, you get an opportunity for a, a discourse. And I think that might be something that, you know, because um, the House of Justice has been encouraging us over the last few years to begin to become engaged with the discourses of society, not to go into them with this sense of um, we know best, we have all the answers, but rather just to create a space where you ask certain questions and you bring people together to, to, to have this kind of discourse around themes. So I wonder yeah if there's if there might be scope for something like the mona foundation not just to talk about its work and its interests but but to sort of create that kind of audio space where people can come and explore things um and some of the principles that underpin it you know can i speak to this uh, i have something to offer to john so so john i also have an organization called the center for peace and global governance and i really wanted to get involved in the public discourse arena and not just, so I've been listening to what Omid was saying about niche, and, and I struggled with this. Should I stick to global governance questions, which is what our, you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as, as a nonprofit, or should it, or should I broaden the conversation? So I ultimately decided to experiment with a video podcast that comes out once a week. Um, and it's been, I, I was amazed, as Omid said, I was amazed by the receptivity. The topics that, that, we, um, that we share about each week are completely different and have to do with something that the world is grappling with. Um, in fact, the last two sessions were precisely on, I didn't realize we'd be discussing this today, but the, you know, honing the skill of ferreting out truth for ourselves and how to get away from opinions and, um, you know, and then linking it to the idea of the maturation of humanity and that this is the stage where we need to get away from, our, you know, the old patterns of listening to what the clergy tell us without, without uh, thinking for ourselves and so on and so forth. So it's been, it's been successful. And, and I, I had a, a, a question about whether um, you think um, to Omid and Rob, it's okay to just take the audio tracks from video podcasts 
and just put them into a podcast, an audio podcast, say on Podbean, or whether you really, you know, how much editing, so Omid, you talked about the fact it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Do I have to go in and do massive editing or is it okay if I just, you know, go ahead and upload the stuff onto the hosting company, you know, website and, and let them push it out? I mean, I would say when I look at the podcast space now and Rob, you may be able to speak better to this, but I feel like some of the biggest podcasts are video and audio and that audio is simply a rip of the video track put onto podcast services so and I think ultimately that's how you get your podcast to grow to have it in as many places as possible so even if it is not you know and I, I've seen others do this even if it's not part of the sort of podcasting space it's okay to put an audio version on YouTube with just an image it doesn't even have to have a, a video but it's just one other place that people can find it not everyone is listening to podcasts through apps on their phones, a lot of people are still doing it through their web browser and YouTube has become a, a big space for the podcasting community. There was one technical question as well. Uh, is there any advice on the right mic? Yeah. I think uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I mean, I just, I've, I found this one, which is AloxCon. Alvoxcon. I don't know. I, I did exactly what I would imagine most people did, which is I just Googled best microphones for podcasting. <laughs> and uh, there are actually kit. I mean, some of some of the magazines like Witch magazine, things like that, they do, you know, the 10 best, you know, if you want to start podcasting, you know, what mic should you have? What what um, what kind of setup should you have? Popped up briefly. I, I didn't see who it was from, but I saw someone saying Blue Yeti mm -hmm. is one of the most popular. And that is... That is pretty much, that was my go-to. But I will also say, don't spend too much on a mic because you open up a world of issues for yourself. Suddenly you find yourself with a very sensitive mic that you need to then put soundproofing in your room and you have to think of everything else and it's picking up stuff happening a million miles away. So sometimes a little cheaper does help kind of cover up some of the cracks. Yeah. I, I should say, actually, the very best quality that I've come across for myself um, is my phone. It's just the, the voice memo app on my phone. Yeah, it's and really if, solid. Yeah, and if you go under the covers, if you put your duvet over your head, <laughs> you've got like the perfect soundproof. I mean, you wouldn't want to put that on video, but um, <laughs> the actual, the soundproofing is much better than, I bought this, um, I bought this thing that you put around the back of the microphone, which is meant to sort of cushion the sound, but it doesn't, it doesn't do half a good as job as the uh, duvet over the head, you know. But Alexandre, you, you've been waiting for some time to, to ask your question. Yeah, so first, thank you. It was really, really insightful. I, I love the fact that Omid, you know, helped me understand about like his story about getting the facts and the depth and also Rob talking about moderation. So very insightful uh, talk. Thank you for that. And my question, which I wrote in the chat is really about, uh, you know, I decided six months ago to build a podcast and I've been uh, I do a lot of live webinars and program, but I was starting to build it and I really struggled in this niche narrowing down specific aspect. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any advice on how to, to go about this process. So of course you look internally about your interest and like Rob, I have many, and then you look at your audience and their needs. And then you look at what's in the market to try to see, you know, how you can listen to other things and to find the, the right place where you add more value and uh, I just find it quite different to in terms of content and uh, format and audiences engagement as well how to evolve in this process I think first thing is you have to be passionate about what uh, you can be interested in lots of things but find something that you're really passionate about because if you want to if you want to talk about something every week or every few days year in year out you know you've got to you've got to put yourself you've got to find it interesting you know and the, and, and I suppose, I mean, you did just mention this, but, you know, to, to read the market, see what's out there, who else is doing this kind of thing? What is it that I could do that, that they're not doing yet? You know, so if it's an EBBF type thing, you know, who's talking about values in business, who's talking about, you know, bringing new paradigms to the, the workplace or whatever it may be, you know, or if you are going to do something that someone else is doing, are you, how do you bring it? you know, make it something different, 
And that might be the interact, you know, the guests you get or the interactions you have with the people you're presenting with or how 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 topical are you going to be? Are you going to like Amit mentioned a few times the news cycle, you know, are you just going to go ahead and do the things uh, that uh, you're interested in or are you going to respond to things? So this week in, in the news, they've been talking about this you know how am i how am i going to reflect that in what i'm doing so but i mean i i don't know it, it's been really curious when we started ponder you know the, like the very first one we did we had about 600 um downloads from podbean and i i think i i suspect it was just people were just curious you know it's like people knew us the the team that were putting it together and they thought you know that's i want to see what they're up to but I, I noticed three level because we were very broad. Um, I did one about uh, an opera, about 200 people listened to it, you know, and you kind of think people just might see the word opera and it just, I'm not interested in that. And it's the same with history hit actually, you know, people love the second world war and the first world war, they can't get enough of it. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, you can just keep putting that out and they'll, they'll keep coming back for more and more. But like, I think, you know, it, it's about, I suppose, like Omid was saying, it's like the brand, isn't it? Perhaps it's, you can begin to introduce other things, you know, and hope that some of your regulars will, will stay with it. And great episode titles. I think sometimes you can kind of almost play around with the, the topics that you're covering that may veer out of what your sort of niche was at the beginning. But as long as you still have catchy titles, people will click. And I find that when people click on the episode, then they're sticking with you for the rest of it anyway, um, because they subscribed for a reason in the first place. But sometimes I think people will see the topic in the episode title, and that will be what they des- what helps them decide if you're one of the shows that they've subscribed to that they're going to listen to that day so if you look at my podcast you'll find that most times most of the titles are almost the same thing because well, you learn after a while what it is people are there for but of course once they're in as long as they're getting that thing in one place you've then got 75 percent of the show to do whatever you want in that's also something working with the experience right you make with your audience you really have to build a relationship with them as well right and that's a really great insight. And then now we have a question from, from the moment. The, com- the statement was made that the newspapers tend to be uh, full of comment and opinion. Um, I was wondering what the opinion of the panelists is about the newspaper I, which tries just to give the news uh, without giving a lot of comment and opinion. First of all, is it possible to just give news without opinion? Secondly, um, do you think that the eye has succeeded in doing that? Has trying to do that had an impact on other news sources? Um, and the third, uh, third part of my question is, do you think that is uh, something that you know, Baha'is should aim for, or uh, will, it, will there inevitably always be opinion and news mixed together? So firstly, the I is one of my favorite newspapers or is my favorite newspaper for very much that reason, that it is pretty much sort of no nonsense fact. And I think that the industry has become really focused on sort of personality journalism in recent years. I mean, certainly when you watch 24 hour news channels, that mostly is what it is. You're, you're getting snippets of news with sort of 20 minutes of opinion and commentary around it. I think there's a space in every in every story for the informed voice of the journalists that are working on it to bring in perhaps their insights and opinion in the appropriate places to help bring that story alive. Um, and but I think it's when you find yourself and you only need to look at morning TV as an example where you have sort of news anchors, but they're technically there to sort of rile up audiences with whatever shock opinion they have for the day that probably doesn't even reflect their own views it's sort of sort of pantomime journalist journalism in a way and I think we've really gotten into the habit of sort of almost accepting that as normal Um, and so it does pain me when I see 
newspapers such as the Eye struggling when it comes to their circulation. You know, they are one of the the low the lesser read papers because I think that that sort of commentary as a form of entertainment and has become quite in demand but it then does take us into a very dangerous place where commentary is actually shaping the news cycle i mean we see the power that has in the sort of election space particularly in the us but we also see how destructive that can be here in the uk when you have you know certain i'll take piers morgan for example um, you know, or, or, or a number of the commentators we see on television who dangerously make statements such as racism not existing in our streets today. And then you're kind of uh, creating a whole narrative that doesn't even exist simply because one person has said something that they feel that majority of li listeners or viewers would like to hear. Um, the, the level of influence that comment, commentary has on the public can be quite dangerous. Um, but I think that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the podcasting space is that it has removed a lot of the, uh, the noise that surrounds news. I think it's a very safe place to, um, to sort of engage in a, although you're not, but you sort of feels like you're engaging in conversation with someone that is often treating the story or the issues that they're talking about with respect because they're not there for the sort of minute by minute TV ratings or for the splashy headlines. They're there to give you a 45 minute or one hour conversation about something. And I think that's, you find a lot more authenticity in the podcasting space because of that. Can you explain for the people who are not in the UK what the iNews is? I'll, I'll yeah. Share it. The uh, the eye is um, oh thanks yeah the eye is, is is essentially a sibling title to the independent um, but it focuses very much on news by fact without the sort of noise of commentary that we often get yeah. in other papers but it also is quite most times it feels quite politically neutral as well. It's also very engaged or more engaged in social issues compared to some of the other papers as well. Um, okay, thank you. It's mm -hmm. the paper that my both my parents read actually, and that's how I was introduced to it. But it's, it, it's, what, it's also the, our newest newspaper, I think, in terms of launches here in the UK. It's, I don't know how many years it's existed now, t 10, 11 years or so. I was thinking about the news agenda, you know, and I mean, in, in, in the UK, the news agenda is always kind of set, has been set by the Today programme on Radio 4, you know, and that's the kind of the show that all the politicians listen to. And, you know, if the Today programme runs it, you know, they, they basically are feeding all of the other, well, it was, that was certainly the case when I was, you know, spending more time at the BBC that, everyone listened across the Today programme to see. And, and then this sort of clashing of different opinions then becomes the news. You know, it's not, it's not like you're talking about the subject anymore. It's, it's about the fact. And, and we, because we live in a society which is based on this culture of conflict, you know, it's, a, it's an adversarial democracy. We have an opposition. We have a government parliament. We have an opposition. And it's the job of the opposition to constantly challenge you know the government so you've constantly got this clash of differing opinions which which makes up a large amount of the the coverage i guess but i mean i'm just i'm thinking to myself you know like i've just done uh, ruhi book 14 which is about participating in the discourses of society and you know what does it mean what would it look like to create media podcasts whatever it may be that raise things to the level of principle and that those people that come to discuss are actually sharing insights, but with the view to actually addressing the issue and not, not to, you know, just basically engage in an argument so that that argument in itself becomes the news story. Many of the issues that have been raised, I think, are also stem from the fact that news is a business, right? And mm. that it needs to generate money and income and that there's a whole system and machinery behind it. I had my little stint in German tabloid news as well. And really stirring up some sort of conflict from nowhere was really the, the, the business just to get 
things going and get something to report on. And then I have not come across of any successful foundation sponsored journalism or any sort of alternative funding journalism that is that still has the connotation of independence and truthfulness. And so we have another question from Arash. Thank you so much, because this is um, I, I just came across the existence of this session. My questions are very practical and and I'll tell you very quickly why. Recently, I uh, became one of the founders of a new company called Unify, and it's in the energy space because I've been there for quite a while by now. And 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 we're 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 not so much a company; we're actually foundation owned. So I decided to not be a shareholder in this company anymore. And and our intention really is to build up a movement that consists of building from the grassroots level local energy communities that serve each other peer to peer but but the essence is to build up a movement and as we are building up a movement we're exploring all these ways to engage and build up community how do we reach one another and how do we get to spend time with one another and one of one of the channels that we do is that every month we're organizing a walk and we we name that walk the talk and and we're just we literally have a couple of hours walking in nature with with people that want to be a part of the movement and we share stories together and share insights together and that really works. And another channel that we are about to explore is the podcast. How do we engage people in a dialogue and how do we put the question in the middle? Because we don't have the answers ourselves either. What would a good attention span of your audience be when issuing a podcast? Is it 20 minutes? Is it 45 minutes? Is it an hour and a half? Also the interval, should it be a weekly? Should it be bi-weekly or should it be monthly? What works in your opinion? Certainly my experience, um, I would say I wouldn't go over 40 minutes. Uh, I don't know what if Romy agrees, <laughs> but I, I think that, um, you know, you can tell, you can see actually when you look at the statistics, you can see when people are tuning out or some people disappear, up, you know, you might get a large number of people disappear after 10 minutes. You know, they think oh, I'm not, not really interested in this, you know, but I think, I don't think really people will stay around much longer than 40, 45 minutes. I think, you know, also the other thing is it's a very sort of experimental medium still. And I, I think one learns, you know, from trial and error and seeing what works. You know, when you just said we go for walks and have conversations, I just thought that that sounds great. You know, that sounds like a really good podcast. People going for a walk and talking to, with each other. You know, that could be something that, that actually just translates straight across, you know. Mm. But then you might find after you've put a few of them out that, you know, people really don't stay with it for for longer than half an hour or whatever it is, you know. But, um, I, and again, in terms of frequency, I don't know. I mean, probably weekly is good. Uh, as I said, we do a daily one, but um, that's because it's been going for a long time. It's built up a, a really strong audience and they, they expect it. It's part of their day now, like watching the news. Yeah, I, I definitely think that weekly is pretty much the expectation. When someone subscribes to a podcast, it's what they've gotten used to, a sort of standard across the industry. That said, they're obviously, you know, it's quite an investment of time to put together a weekly podcast, especially if you have a lot of other stuff going on. And so it's okay to also approach the podcast as a series. Maybe you only want to do it weekly for sort of eight weeks at a time, and then you can come back for a second series. That's it's not something I've tried, but it's obviously something that we see done quite regularly in the podcasting space. In terms of time, I would say... It, Certainly 30 to 40 minutes is really, I think, ideally where you want to be. Um, there are shorter podcasts, but I would say they then start to feel like sort of snapshots rather than a full, if you think of a radio show, there's nothing on the radio that lasts for that short amount of time, usually, unless it's a sort of special news broadcast or something. But at the same time, if you're also able I think it depends on the person. If you're able to perhaps juggle many different subjects within one podcast or topics, shall I say, within the niche that you've chosen, then you might find that people are willing to stick around for more. I find that when uh, uh, my podcast is very sort of topical in terms of it following the news cycle, 
And obviously, when there are weeks where there's a sort of a higher interest or a bigger interest in the subject that we're talking about, the story that we're talking about that week, we've gone into like an hour and 15 minutes it's sometimes and people will stay from start to end because that is the week that they want as much as they can get but if I was to then do that the following week we find that people will probably tune out after a while so I think 45 minutes is always what we aim for wonderful isn't it after all this time that we were taught to make it short and <laughs> very brief <laughs> that now people are actually really ready to allocate their time to this. I mean, 45 minutes or 40 minutes is a lot of time. And I think it's a great opportunity for, for really good ideas and also mm. having the time to lay them out and, and explain and, and give context. I think that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity. I hope that, that everybody was able to take something aw away from, from today And um, I just wanted to let you know that um, we have prepared a couple of questions or more or less Omid and Rob have prepared a couple of questions that might walk you through the idea of your own podcast, really basic questions that you should, you can answer to yourself to, to end um, this, this wonderful session. Uh, we have prepared a little quote that maybe will give a, a nice little context. From the Universal House of Justice. We face at this time opportunities and responsibilities of vast magnitude and great urgency. Let each believer in his inmost heart resolve not to be seduced by the ephemeral allurements of the society around him, nor to be drawn into its feuds and short-lived enthusiasms, but instead to transfer all he can from the old world to that new one, which is the vision of his longing, and will be the fruit of his labors. This is actually from 1963, <laughs> but I thought it was so fitting to, to our conversation today. Um, well, I cannot thank you enough, Omid and, and Rob, for joining today. And thank you for everybody else also who took the time. Um, and I took so much away from this. I hope we will hear from each other. And if there is any additional questions, we will find a way to keep this conversation going. Stay safe and yeah, be happy and really hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good to meet you all.